Welcome tonight to our uh, first annual wellness lecture sponsored by Fair Court Dental. Yay! Yay! <laughs> You know, we are so fortunate to live in a prosperous community and it amazes me every day that there's more to learn. And I feel so blessed to bring you two experts today in their field. Uh, Dr. Joel Kahn, and he, if you haven't heard Joel before, he lectures worldwide and has written many books and I have had the uh, uh, the experience of his green space in Royal Oak and he has a wonderful green space where you can go and get only green food and uh, he is a cardiologist and he's going to share his knowledge today with us and my other colleague Dr. Reza Debeer and I knew I liked him from the moment I met him he has, my son went to the University of St. Andrews, and this man studied in Dundee. And he is the person that comes behind the cardiologist. He's the cardiac surgeon. So if you don't do what you're supposed to do, you'll be meeting Dr. Reza DeBeer. So they're both here today to share their knowledge with us. And, you know, everything starts with bacteria. And where is there a lot of bacteria in your mouth? So in addition to Reza and Joel, I had asked a patient if he would kindly come and share his story today as well, because he was confronted with uh, an emergency cardiac surgery. And one of the things that his physician first asked was, who is your dentist? Is your dentist, I would like your dentist to sign off uh, prior to surgery. So without further ado, ado, Joel Kahn, a duel. It's a duel today. Thank you. Uh, Joel will start, and then Reza, and then my patient uh, Roger Scully will share a little bit, and I'll conclude today. Um, welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Sue, and it's always a pleasure to. Uh, Visit beautiful Gross Point. For those of you that don't know, I've spent many years in the cath lab at Beaumont. I now do exclusively preventive cardiology, try and prevent visits to my former colleagues and Dr. DeBeer, but uh, I don't win all the time. So it's not going to be a duel, but I'm going to talk a little bit about some steps to leading a long and healthy life. I have written many books, uh, a heart book called Your Whole Heart Solution that made it across the country on PBS. and. My favorite title, Dead Execs Don't Get Bonuses, which keeps selling and selling. I'll leave them in the back and maybe Sue can figure out how to distribute them or put them on her coffee table in her office. Uh, the reference to green space you'll see at the end, but nobody can do just one job. So I'm a cardiologist and a teacher and I own a few restaurants, which is the reason I keep working. Because <laughs> if anybody's a financial planner, you know the story that how do you make a small fortune in the restaurant business? You start with a large fortune. So <laughs> we're living that through. I actually didn't bring a copy of my newest book, but uh, let me go through. So um, one of the reasons I uh, never turned out an opportunity, particularly from Sue, but anybody to speak about heart disease, is it still is so important. We're celebrating a rather bad anniversary this year. For 100 years, 1918 to 2018, heart disease has been the number one cause of death of men and women in the United States. Even though nobody in the room will say I was alive at the time, in 1918 the Spanish flu decimated tens of millions of people. Heart disease rose to be the number one cause of death. And whether we look worldwide where the yellow circle is heart disease as a cause of illness and death. Whether we look across the United States and you see a little mitten-shaped state there, that's one of the 10 top heart disease states in the United States, all by itself in the Midwest, isn't that sad? But it's true, because Michigan is in a heart disease belt. And whether we just go three days ago to a report that was on the media listing the top 20 heart disease capitals in the United States, Fortunately, Detroit came in number two, but Flint came in number one across the United States for the rate of heart disease. So we're trapped. I mean, we are in between uh, two serious pockets of heart disease. And, you know, we got wonderful hospitals and wonderful procedures and wonderful medication, but uh, we're still not completely, even though rates are going down, there's just more of us, number one. And 
uh, Michigan isn't winning the battle as quickly as we should. So we got to work on this. So first I want to define a little bit. We might want to live a long life if we took a poll. Not everybody would sign up for that, a relatively long life. But there's a concept in uh, health and epidemiology called health span. You certainly, whatever number of years you're given, would like to be healthy as long as you can to the very end and make it just a quick little exit. Uh, the gentleman on the left is my grandfather, Abraham who at age 89, swimming in a pool in Florida on vacation, had a heart attack, and that was his last moment. That's called Hellspan, doing laps and boom. You know, uh, sad moment, but an amazing life. Uh, how can we get there? So a few tips on that topic. Again, I'll go beyond that since I uh, already described this. So I always am curious, how many people know of the Blue Zones? Just a few, so I'm always delighted to bring it up. The Blue Zones are a series of books. If you're intrigued at all by this, just either go to Google or go to the uh, Amazon, buy a book. Uh, but a researcher for National Geographic asked the question about 2004, 2005, is it true that the longest lived people and the healthiest people in the world ate Dan and yogurt and lived in the mountains of Russia, or is that not true? And those kind of questions. And he got a research grant from National Geographic to go to birth records, death records, Identify places where people live to 100 years or more, 10 times more than anywhere else in the area. That was the definition. He identified ultimately that it wasn't Dan and Yogurt in Russia. It was five areas from an island in Japan to an island in Greece to an island in Italy, something about islands, to a peninsula in Costa Rica, and one not so small town actually in the United States, an hour east of Los Angeles. Loma Linda, Loma Linda is the home of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, a church that teaches don't smoke, exercise, don't eat many animal products, and don't drink alcohol. Now, they're humans, so it turns out about half of the members, 20 million Adventists around the world, are pretty good at following those prescriptions, and about half don't. But it turns out their longevity in Loma Linda to this day is about a dozen years longer than the rest of California. Mm -hmm. And it triggered a lot of research on what is it about the lifestyle of these five areas that gives exceptional longevity. What's a lesson for you? And though the books are very interesting to read, there's a whole series called The Blue Zone Solution, Blue Zone Health. The nine common findings amongst these five very different areas from Japan to the United States were move and move naturally. You don't necessarily have to join a gym. You don't have to train for the free press marathon, but try very hard not to be a couch potato, computer potato. It works for those of us that work. We're often on our rear end seeing patients at a desk talking. It's very important to get up and move around. And that was uh, this weekend, new guidelines on fitness were announced by the government. And it's like even a standing desk, standing, moving, all count as exercise now. Uh, some is the psychological outlook, know your purpose, know how to relax, know how to decompress from stress, the right outlook. But the eating portion is pretty simple. There's a Japanese principle, eat to your 80% full, not your 120% full, and I'm buttoning your belt. Um, it has led to the current interest I'll talk about in a minute about reducing your calories and fasting. These are five areas around the world people do not overeat. Eat a lot of plants. We saw mainly plants out here in the, uh, in the delicacies, which is a great thing. We saw wine. It turns out these are generally places that people enjoy a little social interaction and wine. And the last part is social. Have connections, have community, whether it's church, whether it's a bowling league, whether it's golf club, whether it's uh, card games. Interesting data just came out of Denmark two weeks ago. Everybody would recognize physical exercise tends to promote good health and even extend life. But a very large and reputable study out of Copenhagen asked the question, which kind of exercise does it? And you'd be very surprised to know tennis was number one and badminton was number two. Any activity done as a group seemed to add even more than the lonely runner and the lonely swimmer. Now, if you're a runner and a swimmer, keep enjoying, keep moving. They did add to longevity. But social activities, I don't know if the foursome at golf with vodka and a cigar counts. They, didn't, they must not golf a lot in Copenhagen because it wasn't on the list of those exercises. So Harvard had another little piece of the equation that if you want to have extra years in life, eat a healthy, largely plant diet. They just defined it. Lots of fruits and vegetables, beans, peas, lentils, whole grains. Do your walking. Do your fitness. And once again, independent research. Have a glass of wine now and then. 
Try and maintain your body weight. That is a tough little one, number four. And number five, of course, don't smoke. How big a difference was it? This is about four-month-old data. Women that did all five of those bullet points lived 14 years longer than the average American, men 12 years longer. Um, we always kind of get it in the end, but we can extend our life with healthy, easy habits, sort of blue zones in America. But let me just quickly go through four specific points. As a cardiologist, the first one is, really uh, key to my heart. And that's this concept that actually goes back 400 years to a famous English physician, Thomas Sydenham, who said, you are as old as your arteries. But if we ask how old your arteries are, you can't just take out a tape measure and ask that. So what I've dedicated my second career of cardiology after a very vigorous hospital cath lab career is to measure and reverse aging arteries. So one quick little clue, and don't look to the person to your right or left, is demonstrated by Steven Spielberg, but a New York internist named Dr. Roger Frank noticed in his patients 50 years ago, if he had a diagnosis of heart disease for these patients, he noticed a strange little line in their earlobe. He called it the diagonal earlobe crease. It took 50 years with the advent of what we call heart cat scans and other advanced modalities. I'll show you in a minute. Turns out it's pretty accurate. Go see your doctor if you've got a deep airlobe crease and you don't think you have heart trouble. It seems odd, but there's about five to six studies of large size that suggest it. Beyond that, we're not very good in the office predicting who has heart disease. We have Winston Churchill made it into his 90s. Everybody would have said he's a candidate for a heart attack or stroke, didn't happen. And if anybody's old enough to remember Jim Fix and other people of great fitness said, don't make it. He was 53, dropped out of a heart attack. Physical, external appearance matters, but it's not good enough. You want better than that for your own health and your families. So I'll just tell you, every hospital in this community, from St. John to St. John Macomb to Gross Point Beaumont, will do the study on your left, which is a CAT scan of the heart. Let me tell you, if you've had a bypass, if you've had a stent, if you've had a heart attack or a catheterization, you can close out for a moment because this doesn't apply to you. But if you're 40, 45, 55, 65, 70, maybe 75, for $100 at a hospital, in 10 seconds, without any needle, without any injection, you get a picture. And the picture might be the one that says normal, where your heart arteries have not shown any aging. This is called a heart calcium score. You might have medium, or you might be the person closest to me. Very severe aging arteries. No symptoms, no clue. The stethoscope doesn't tell you. The EKG doesn't tell you. Very big difference in the approach to these people. I've been on this bandwagon personally for about 15, 18 years teaching, lecturing. Turns out again this weekend in Chicago at the American Heart Association, we finally got a very, very strong endorsement that if you see your internist and considering or your family doc, put you on Lipitor, maybe you need it, maybe you don't, they said get the test. If your arteries are aging, you better get on some stuff. If your arteries are youthful, just you know, use some lifestyle measures, which is how I've been practicing for a long time, and it's nice to see it validated. In my office, I often have the opportunity to do this thing, which is using an ultrasound this time, actually demonstrating arteries cleaning up by an ultrasound of the carotids. That takes good oral health, that takes good diet, that takes good sleep, that takes not smoking, that takes some vitamins. This scan used to say a 67-year-old man with 75 years old arterial age and now actually is younger than their birth date. And that happens. We really can very often make a major impact on reversing this disease. I'll skip by that. Number two out of four, very quickly, what you eat is very important. And I promote to my patients, just eat a lot of plants. I don't care what you eat with the plants, eat a lot of plants. If you have oatmeal, I want you to have berries. If you have an omelet, I want you to have a, a tomato and some spinach with it. If you're having a sandwich, I want lettuce and tomato, or just eat lettuce and tomato, it's fine by me too. And, you know, and try a bean stew, not a beef stew. Why? Because the data is very strong that one of the best things you can do for your health is move as far down as you're willing to, no judgment made, because it'll impact your risk of arthritis, diabetes, asthma, obesity, aging, dementia. You can do it all the way as I've done for decades. You don't have to, and that's why I have restaurants because it's been fun to kind of bring some uh, uh, new food experiences of people of Detroit and the suburbs, or you can do it part of the time, but there's no excuse, you gotta do it. It's good for oral health, it's better than certainly sugars and candies, uh, and get your fruits and vegetables in. Data all over the world, Harvard has said if we'd eat less meat and more plants, we would cut death and uh, disability tremendously. 
other data that what's called all-cause mortality, that we could drop uh, death and increase health uh, by just eating more and more berries with our oatmeal instead of eggs and bacon. At least a few days a week in the morning would be a good idea. And it's a very powerful thing. Some of you will know the name Nathan Pritikin and the Pritikin Center, or Dr. Dean Ornish, uh, and fundamental research now that's actually decades old, but it is still very uh, relevant and pertinent. It, hasn't uh, become outdated that diet has a huge impact on our health, diet has a huge impact on our cardiac health, has a huge impact on our oral health. Uh, step three is an odd one, but it goes with that blue zones, eat to your 80% full. And I just returned this weekend from Los Angeles at the first international conference on the science of aging and fasting. And it is now absolutely uh, clear that one of the best things you can do to slow aging is actually once in a while shut the mouth, take a break, and let the body heal during that period, something none of us were taught in medical school years ago. I'm going to skip through this for a second. Most of the science goes to a uh, Italian-born scientist who's at University of Southern California, Dr. Walter Longo, and I will say this, my books are wonderful. If you're going to read Dr. Stanish's book, it's mandatory. You have to read it. But after you read those, I would strongly suggest you find a book that came out in January called The Longevity Diet by Dr. Longo, laying out a plan based on very, very advanced science, biochemistry, molecular biology, how eating can slow aging and even reverse aging. And this is a scientist who has no affiliation with a food company, has no conflicts. It's just pure science. He started studying yeast and figured out how when we cut back our calories, we can slow aging. Turns out the exact pathways he discovered, which are now world renowned as mechanisms of aging and cell death, are exactly the same in humans. I won't go through this. It was a stroke of genius and some luck that when he started studying these little, little yeast that are used to make beer, turns out it's the same pathway of aging and the same response. It says way over on your left, Glucose and amino acids. It turns out when you have too much sugar, just like your mother told you, and amino acids might surprise you. Amino acids are the building block of protein, but there is data now. I break from protein now and then, which is basically cut back on animal foods uh, now and then, is very good for your aging. Dr. Longo created a five-day program that tortures you to eat a little less of healthy foods and uh, activates pathways that slows aging and reverses it. And this is scientifically one of the hottest uh, projects out there, but it's available to anybody and something I use in my patients to lower their blood sugar and such. And in studies he's published, you can actually cause stem cells. Some of you have heard of stem cells. Maybe you've had them in your, in your knees or your wrists, or maybe you know people have gone to Tijuana to get them. Well, it turns out if you eat for a few days a month, Dr. Longo's program of plants and reduced calories, you make your own stem cells and you release them in the blood and you actually can heal things as disparate as actually some evidence for multiple sclerosis and diabetes by stem cell release. And the last one, and I'll finish, is the topic at hand, that it is very important to appreciate the role of the mouth in uh, all diseases and in heart disease, we learned 150 years ago that we can have a fire in the body called inflammation. And we learned indeed that this often starts by having a war with our bacteria in our mouth that then leak in through various chemicals and can cause disease throughout the body from the brain uh, and below, but it certainly has a connection to the heart. We know that we have twice the risk, at least, if we have a, a very well-qualified dentist identify gum disease, which starts in your own home by noticing bleeding and, and, uh, and some pain and maybe some recession of your guns, get to a specialist like Dr. Sue and get it checked. Uh, even stroke is now related to having uh, sometimes subtle, sometimes asymptomatic, sometimes hidden pockets of infection in the mouth. So it's routine in my practice to discuss this and discuss oral habits with patients and refer for more advanced evaluation, certainly if there's inflammation that shows up. Because we know it's not just the old-fashioned 
um, connection where if you have a valve problem, and we might hear a little later about a valve problem, you might take antibiotics before the dentist. It's these silent hidden things. So both the American Diabetes Association, American Dental Association, American Heart Association, on and on, have emphasized this connection and the care we should take but also the advanced evaluation that I think we'll be hearing a little bit more of. So a healthy start to, uh, mouth and a healthy heart does truly start with a healthy mouth. So I just want everybody to know it is a very, very exciting part of science now to talk about not just how to live longer, which is going to be possible in the next five to 10 years, but living better, living freer of disease, less pain, less medication. Uh, I think there will be a day we go to a parts department and we can pick out what we need to replace, but the key that you hear from serious experts on aging is start now on lifestyle. Start now, don't smoke, take a walk, eat a salad, uh, avoid the, the pop, avoid the cookie, uh, except for tonight you're allowed one or two. You know, and take, you know, get your sleep. You know, if you drink, drink in moderation, don't smoke, because you want to show up to this game, this game that's happening called serious medicine of anti-aging and regenerative medicine. You want to show up as healthy as you can because it really is going to transform uh, medicine around the world. So if you want to know more about the general area of living healthy lives, there's a documentary on Netflix called Forks Over Knives. I'd certainly recommend you. Uh, the China study, uh, it was a transformative book in my own education. I do need things in my office on Kirchival and over in Bingham Farms and Telegraph, both places. And if you ever have a chance, we're over in Ferndale in a very big festive restaurant and bar on Nine Mile and Woodward, and a little smaller organic restaurant by Birmingham at 14 and Woodward. That's just what I do at the end of the day because, uh, you know, just a lot of energy and a fun family business we created. So thank you for your time and attention. I'm very excited to hear what my colleague has to share with us, and I'm going to learn with you. And thank you for the invitation. Well, um, good evening. I'm uh, Reza Dabia. I um, have one disclosure, and that is that Mary Sue is my dentist. <laughs> <laughs> um, I um, should confess to you that, like uh, most stereotypic dentists, she did not ask me to uh, stand here in, in front of you and give you a talk while she was uh, giving me <laughs> dental care. <laughs> Yeah, you've all been there, I think, or you can imagine when, you know, the dentist working in your mouth and carries on a conversation and expects an answer, and you go, ah. <laughs> she didn't do that, actually, and um, we started talking beforehand, and the common connection was, in fact, um, you know, Scotland. Um, Mary Sue, thanks. If ever I was going to do this again, please remind me never, ever, ever to follow Dr. Joel Kahn. <laughs> Thank you very much. So another disclosure that I would like to at least share with Dr. Khan um, and the rest of you is that I went to medical school in Scotland in Dundee, which is not that many miles um, east of a fantastic city in Scotland called Glasgow. Glasgow, uh, they did a study, had the highest incidence of heart disease in uh, one of the highest incidence of uh, heart disease in the world. And uh, not being that many miles away from Dundee, some of that culture spilt over into Dundee. And I can tell you one of our most favorite places in Dundee was to go to Sweaty Betty's and Sweaty Beats um, shop. And you would get the very best of a protein-based human um, pie that was just delicious along with chips and they would be deep fried in front of you and you uh, there was no menu it was served in a newspaper and um, that was it and we loved it so I don't know what my coronary arteries look like <laughs> but I think I might get a CT scan so anyway uh, moving along um, cardiovascular disease and the role of oral um, health and bacteria. So really, what does good oral hygiene have to do with heart surgery? That's me, and that's my operating room team. Um, that's after you've seen Dr. Khan's colleagues, who um, really helped you as best they could. Uh, that's my surgical team. 
And that's the person on the operating room table. Trust me, you don't want to be that person. So, um, just to give you a um, perspective, let's move on because that's really, uh, uh, thank you. Um, so cardiovascular disease is um, really been, if I asked you, what do you understand by cardiovascular disease, you'd sort of say, well, it's um, dyslipidemia. But over the past decades, our understanding of cardiovascular disease has really increased tremendously. Uh, infections, um, including those caused by oral bacteria, are most likely involved in cardiovascular progression than previously thought. There's a tremendous amount of interest in that area. Cardiovascular disease is diseases of the circulatory system, which Dr. Khan has alluded to. And it includes in its extreme forms um, heart attacks, strokes, and they are, as Dr. Khan has said, the leading cause of death in the Western societies. The roles of infection and inflammation in atherosclerosis, which is hardening of the arteries of, um, generalized throughout the body, have become increasingly apparent. The chronic inflammatory periodontal diseases are now among the most common human infections, and 10 to 15% of the population experience advanced disease of this type. Individuals with periodontitis are at risk of developing cardiovascular disease, and that includes coronary artery disease, strokes, myocardial infarctions, and generally hardening of the arteries. And um, not to bore you too terribly much, but a group of gram-negative anaerobic bacteria have now been found as pathogens in many periodontous lesions, and Mary Sue will talk about that, I'm sure. And they have been nominated as the red complex, red being inflammatory. So, leaving all of that aside, I'll just give you a few slides. This is the heart. And the heart is a fantastic organ. Um, from early on in the uterus, it starts pumping until we're dead. It is a muscular organ. It has two sides, basically divided by partitions, muscular partitions. The right side, the blue, collects basically the blood from the rest of the body, pumps it to the lungs, where we get oxygen. The blood gets oxygenation and it uh, comes back into the left side of the heart and pumps through the main artery of the heart called the aorta to the rest of the body. And it is really four chambers. The blood goes it's, uh, in the direction that it does, and it's by one-way valves. There are four of them in the heart, two on the left, uh, two on the right, and two on the left. Thank you. But do we really, really need it? I'm sorry? <laughs> so, <laughs> um, adult, adult uh, coronary artery disease is really blockages of one or more arteries that supply blood to the heart muscle, and it's usually due to hardening of the arteries, which Dr. Khan has alluded to. Thanks. thanks. Um, in a schematic form, this is uh, fatty deposits, and known as plaques, that are um, deposited in the um, lumen of the arteries and they compromise the flow of blood. Thanks. So the factors that are implicated in cardiovascular disease, genetics, sorry, you can't do much about that. But the rest of them we can do something about. And that's what really Dr. Khan has alluded to. I think we can control or at least help to control high blood pressure, diabetes, obesity, dyslipidemia, that's high cholesterol, and abnormal lipid uh, metabolism, smoking, sedentary lifestyles, and periodontal disease. Yes, next, thank you. So what do um, folks do when they have blockages in the arteries of the heart? They see Dr. Khan and his colleagues, the invasive cardiologists, they do surgical widening of a blocked or narrow blood vessel, especially the coronary arteries, by means of these fantastically designed balloons and stents, and we'll see um, these catheters that are just phenomenal feats of uh, design, I think, incredibly superb. Um, they go through an artery, either in your groin, the femoral artery, or currently now uh, the vogue is through the wrist, the radial artery. They go in, they do a balloon, 
uh, of the plaque. And the way I like to describe it to patients who say, well, what does a stent mean? I don't do stenting. And I say, talk to the cardiologist. But in freshly laid snow, if you've ever gone out and walked and you put your foot down and you crush the snow, that's what basically the balloon does. It uh, crushes the plaque against the artery wall. And to prevent it coming back, they put these um, stents in. Next, please. If um, that isn't the treatment of choice, this is, um, and this truly is the Humpty Dumpty falling off the wall because now you're into the domain of heart surgery, which is what I do. And uh, this is a schematic representation of two bypasses. The blue that you can see, um, is a vein that's taken out of the legs and this is an arterial uh, artery that's harvested from inside the left chest and it's put usually to the artery on the front of the heart called the left anterior descending coronary artery um, and it has been shown to actually affect long-term survival. Next, please. Okay. So now, the other area that you want to, uh, that I'd like to bring to your attention is endocarditis, and that's infection of the inner lining of the heart and the valves, mostly likely caused by bacteria. Next. Thank you. Um, the risk factors for infective endocarditis are intravenous introduction of bacteria. Uh, commonly, unfortunately, there's an epidemic in the United States, and that is uh, intravenous drug abusers, and they usually affect the right-sided heart valves, commonly the tricuspid valve. And believe it or not, periodontal disease and oral bacteria. Okay. Um, the common bacteria are Staphylococcus, Streptococcus, and gram-negative uh, organisms, and Mary Sue will address those. Thank you. So this is the heart, a uh, uh, fantastic organ, muscular. It's about the size of your fist. If you rest it in the middle of your chest where your thumb is pointed to the left side, that's the size of your heart. It's four chambers protect, and um, has four valves. This is the aortic valve schematically in a cartoon diagram showing you a normal opening and a normal closing. Next, please. This is an infection that settles on the tricuspid valve. That would be a typical of the, today, of a drug abuser. And the mitral valve just happens to be the valve on the, one of the valves on the left side of the heart. Okay. On the left is the tricuspid, uh, is a trileaflet valve, which is the aortic valve. And these va um, valves are incredibly delicate structures, yet they function so superbly. Um, if you were to take a cusp of that and hold it up to light and shine light through it, you could at least discern newsprint through it. That's how delicate these structures are. On the right, is your infected valve. The infection has destroyed the leaflets. It has made them incompetent, which means that they don't function, they're leaky. And in a more serious infection, they can erode the seat of the valve that is the, this part. And it can also erode into the um, outside of the seat of the valve, creating fistulas, which are abnormal channels, um, an exceedingly serious complication. How is infective endocarditis treated? With antibiotics, initially um, intravenously, uh, while the patient is in the hospital, and then they get discharged into a more long-term care facility, but still with intravenous antibiotics, and after six weeks, generally, they're told to take oral antibiotics. If all else fails and the patient does not respond to antibiotic therapy, they get valve replacements, and this is just one of the, um, uh, the man-made well, man um, uh, valve prostheses. 
So the final comment that I'd like to kind of leave with you, and it really goes back to what Dr. Khan was saying, what does that mean for a patient with infective endocarditis? Well, if you are unfortunate enough into um, being in that situation where you have to seek treatment for infective endocarditis, it's a long road for you as a patient. Also, it's a very costly road for the society. Heart surgery itself will cost north of $30,000. It'll be multiples of that by the time you um, leave the um, long-term care facility. Um, it literally is a huge burden to um, treat um, patients with infective endocarditis. And when I see a patient for heart surgery, we go through a pre-optimization questionnaire, and um, it's the standard routine. We go over the history of the patient. We're looking for kidney function, lung function, their mobility, their lifestyle, um, BMIs, and their mobility. And one of the questions that we're asking now is, um, when was the last time you saw your dentist? Um, oh, you haven't seen your dentist? Well, you really ought to. And the cutoff for us is six months. We really like for people to see their dentist and have a sign off. And it's very, very important. Um, we are really putting a tremendous amount of emphasis on that because there's a tremendous amount of evidence that now points to the health of your mouth affecting the rest of your health. And on that point, I'll uh, finish. Thank you. You know, I've dedicated my whole career to this, and it's so thrilling to be able to work with Joel and Reza and really bring this to you. We're taping today so that not only our community could hear some of these facts and really bring them home. Uh, it's just thrilling for me to be able to share my knowledge and have respect of the rest of the medical community. And on that note, I would like to talk a little bit about oral DNA. We all have DNA, and we all have a fingerprint, and there is a fingerprint in our mouths as well. And, and with this fingerprint in our mouths, that fingerprint also impacts the rest of our bodies. And if you are a patient of mine, you know that when you do come in, we do a comprehensive evaluation of your gums. And uh, as Reza was saying, there are gram-negative bacteria that, are, that do, are very caustic. And when we are measuring your gum health, if you do have deeper gum pockets, and bleeding whatsoever, what does bleeding mean? Bleeding means inflammation. And bleeding means there is caustic bacteria in your mouth that's getting into the rest of your body. And so we do have a disinfection protocol that we follow, and we follow this routinely for every patient. And we believe that through this disinfection protocol, uh, we can really impact the rest of your overall wellness, just like Reza and Joel reported. And so, do you carry the genetic marker for gum disease? Now, when we're, we are routinely saliva testing our patients that present with any gum disease at all, and we do check for a genome to check if you're low, moderate, or high risk, and also to see if you have the gen genetic marker interleukin-6, which uh, represents itself as a genetic marker for gum disease. And so when you do have a saliva test, if you were to come back with a marker like this, what we're finding is that we need to be more proactive. We need to even try harder. It isn't just a matter of, you know, there's no cookie cutter approach. So when someone catches me and says, what kind of toothpaste do you recommend? What kind of, that's not the kind of practice I have. And that's not the kind of practice that these two men practice. We have very specific guidelines that we follow for each and every patient. So we put together uh, just really 
honed in recipes for success for each of our patients. So not one patient has the same protocol. If you were to come in and we do some saliva testing and find out that you have an intermediate, intermediate or what if you have a high risk to, with this genetic marker present, we got to pull all the guns out. So to get my patient ready to see uh, Reza Debeer for cardiac surgery, we're going to really need to work hard and I'm going to need your help as a patient because I can't do it on my own. Uh, Teresa is a hygienist in our practice and she will tell you that we practice the highest standard of care in our practice with the latest and greatest techniques and she will tell you how hard she works. So one of the first things that we do in a patient that shows any sign of gum disease is that we do do a saliva test and the saliva test comes back and you can see we're, we're measuring all these bacteria. So these are all different bacteria that are indications for, that you have gum disease and we're measuring to see if you're meeting a threshold. And if your, your bacteria is above a th certain threshold, a certain gold standard, we know that we need to target that bacteria. We also know that all these bacteria affect different body parts and different organs. So there are certain bacteria that are really more impactful in your lung health. And so when we find out what these bacteria are, we can help target other organs that may be deteriorating. So or oral bacteria causes other systemic illness stroke, heart disease, pregnancy complications. We know now that we recommend that women that are pregnant get in more than just every six months because if there's any inflammation, science tells us that babies are born early. Uh, Preterm, low birth weight babies are born from mothers that have gum disease. Uh, I'd like to share Roger's story. Roger, will you come up? I have a patient with us today that had a cardiac complication, and he's kind enough to share his story. When we uh, took his saliva test, he's allowed me to share his saliva test, and you can see, you can tell about your cardiac story. And Oh, no, you tell about it. Uh, <laughs> it, it upsets me to hear this. So his bacteria was above this threshold line. The black line is threshold. And so we were targeting, he had one high-risk pathogen above the threshold, uh, close to the threshold line, but he had two moderate-risk pathogens and a low-risk pathogen that were quite above the threshold line. And the floor is yours, sir. Wow. I told him he had five minutes. <laughs> Believe me, I don't want to take five minutes. I mean, this, this is, it's a little bit crazy for me because I actually, um, uh, at this point in my life, I'm a cantor, a class in the, in the uh, synagogue, and I usually sing. And so I'm much more comfortable when I'm singing than when I'm talking <laughs> because at least I know what I have to do when I'm singing. I have absolutely no idea what's going to come out of my mouth when I'm talking. I, I am so delighted and so terrified to meet these two wonderful doctors. As I looked at the slides up here, I thought, never mind, you don't want to know what I thought. It, really, there, there's, there was a point where I was dragging around an oxygen tank, and as I went stumbling into Dr. Stoner's office with that, and I heard another physician friend tell me, oh, it's okay, my father died of this. <laughs> and I had to have an aortic valve replacement. Now, somebody suggested I bring a cowbell with me because mine is bovine. <laughs> <laughs> I was wondering if I could play cards with a card, you know, with a surgeon. Maybe I could get a human one, but I didn't know if that was better or worse. Or, I mean, they might have got a poor scene one that everybody says was a kosher. You know, okay. <laughs> all, all kinds of crazy things like that. Uh, you know, Mary Sue talks in her book about uh, uh, C-reactive proteins, which uh, she 
she says is an acronym, CPR. It reminds me of a story a friend of mine tells about um, a, 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 an organization that put itself together. It was called the Southeast Michigan University of Technology, but they realized that the acronym was SMUT. And so <laughs> I, I really said to Dr. Khan today, a few minutes ago, I said, you know, what I really have to do is, is I really should sing the Hebrew prayer that I won't, I won't, believe me, I won't do it. I promise I won't do it. But it does say, I want to thank you for enabling us to be alive, to be able to have been raised up literally, and to be able to be here tonight. To be able to be here tonight is a miracle. I owe the medical profession a tremendous vote of thanks. I won't tell you where I had the surgery done because, well, oh well. Dr. Khan, this book opera has a place, as I said, on the bookshelf to my immediate right when I sit down in my study. And I even take it out. Eh, maybe once every two weeks, once every yeah. But whenever I have a question in my mind, I say, I wonder what Dr. Khan said. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. That's right. I don't want to know what you do. I really <laughs> don't. But I do know that this fellow came out afterwards, and he, my wife tells me he was screaming, the gradient is beautiful, and I didn't think I was that gorgeous. But, uh, <laughs> Uh, apparently that has something to do with the, uh, yeah, the, the way it, yeah, he put it in rather well. At any rate, I have almost six years now. I'm hoping to get maybe 26 more with uh, the advances in medicine. I am so thankful. I guess I'm most thankful in many ways for the time that I know that Mary Sue spent talking to my cardiac surgeon. That was time that was, I don't know how to say thank you enough. Thank you for my life, Mary Sue. So, Roger, you don't have to leave yet. So Roger went through a procedure called gum decontamination. It's simple. We just get you numb, and the hygienist works to get all the accretions below the gum line removed and we use a laser which is state of the art and it kills bacteria, it stimulates new bone growth and new cell growth and then a month later we retest and so this is Roger's retest. So you can see, yay! And at this point I can give him a release to go into surgery knowing in my heart I have gotten him to the point where he's healthy enough that the bacteria aren't going to get lodged in Reza's procedure, in Reza's uh, surgical site, and cause a problem. So uh, there's truth to this, and I'm so glad you're here today. I'm so thankful for Roger to share his story because it kind of makes it come alive. And I'm glad that Roger understands Joel's impact and all the contributions you've made, Joel, really, thank you. And I don't know if there's another slide. Let's see what's at the end here. Uh, big thanks, yeah. Thank you. Once again, a last word. Thank you so much, Mary Sue. Thank you for a life that's really been very wonderful. Thank you my, to the medical profession for making it possible. Go get your teeth cleaned, guys. <laughs> and Joel and Reza, if you'd come up, I'd like to just give you a certificate of appreciation. Dr. Joel Kahn. Yes. And next year, we already have our speaker lined up for 
uh, the similar week, and it will be Dr. Pamela Smith, and she will be speaking on autoimmune disorders and their impact on and the oral systemic connection to autoimmune disorders. So thank you everyone for coming.